live from the 2014 AES show in Los Angeles, California. Audio-Technica presents Ask Me Anything. And now, here is your host and moderator, Jeff Simcox. Hello, everyone. And here we are for our third session of the day on the second day of AES in the Audio-Technica booth. We have with us... George dramatic, Jones. Dramatic pause. We have with us illustrious drummer Kurt Biscara. Let me tell you a little bit about Kurt. Kurt Biscara, the world renowned, how do you like that, studio drummer? Sounds scary. Affectionately referred to as Kirky B. We'll get, we'll get to that later. Kirky B. Uh, by those who know him best, is a legend in his own right, having played with more famous artists than we have room to name. He's in demand both in the studio and on the road. His impressive client list includes everyone from Mick Jagger, Elton John, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Seal John Fogarty, Sarah McLaughlin, John Legend, to on and on and on more names. Johnny Cash, Celine Dion, Billy Joel, Tina Turner, Donny Osmond, Lionel Richie. Wow. He's diverse for sure. Uh, Have drums, it, will in, <laughs> we'll play. In addition to his long list of hit records and major tours, he's also worked on soundtracks for several blockbuster movies, including Despicable Me, The Born Supremacy, The Craft, and She's the One. In the coming weeks, Kurt will join Sarah McLaughlin as the drummer on her Canadian tour. Next True. Wednesday, I leave. Next Wednesday? Yeah. So We're touring Canada. Here we are. Welcome me in, uh, join, er, join me in welcoming Kurt Biscara. Hello, everybody. Applause, applause. Ask me anything. Ask him anything. And I mean that, really. As long as within the realm of audio and drumming, nothing uh, and, and common <laughs> decency. And, okay, well, um, one minute. So, this is being live streamed. Uh, we are taking questions from the, the uh, show audience and via Twitter and via live stream. The person who is deemed by the people in the back on the show floor to have asked the best question will receive a pair of Audio-Technica ATH M50X headphones for their participation. So yes. with that said, who would like to ask a question? Any question. Okay, Within so reason, Rox. My question for you is... Yes. How many different artists have you played on their albums? Oh God, I, I honestly I can't answer that. Um, the best record of that are re that's recorded that you could read about. You could go to allmusic.com and type in my name, and, uh, and it has all my discography. But uh, you know, I I started playing drums uh, at an early age at three. I played in jazz clubs with my mom in her B3 trio, and then um, went on to Musicians Institute after I graduated high school. And my first gig was with uh, Morris Day and The Time at the age of 19. Yes. So that was my first gig. And uh, Morris, I, I credit Morris Day as my mentor and, and, um, and, a, and a guy who really like showed me how to become a, a, a great live drummer as well as a studio drummer. Because you know, as you know, he played on a lot of records himself with Prince, and and so he he really, to me, was was a drummer that uh, I uh, aspired to be like, as well as all the other amazing drummers. And rocks that question is <laughs> is too deep to answer right now. I I don't know, but uh, if you go to All Music or go to my website, kurtbiscara.com, there's a link directly to All Music, and you could see my discography. Cool, great question. What else we got? More questions from the house. All these people. There's too there many hands. Um, hi, how's it going? Um, hey, Ben. Who is, uh, who is the most challenging, or what was the most challenging studio experience you've had recording? Um, I, right, off, right off the bat, I'd have to say uh, in the 90s, I, I did a record with Carl Perkins and uh, the late, great Carl Perkins and the late, great Johnny Cash, and it was Rick Rubin producing, and... Uh, you know, just the sheer fact it was those two legends, just I, I couldn't play because, you know, how do you play along with such great top-notch talent such as those two guys? So it was nerve-wracking, but 
because Rick was there and, and um, the great players that were surrounding me, you know, Ben Montench and, and uh, you know, basically the, the Heartbreakers were the backing band and I was playing drums. It was easy to do. So they made it relaxing. And uh, But definitely, yeah, Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash, those two guys were pretty intense. Cool. Great question. Thank, Thank you, ben. you. What do we got? Um, as far as miking a, a snare, there's so many different uh, techniques. What is the uh, most elaborate technique that you've seen uh, miking a snare drum? Well, specifically speaking about the Audio Technica mics, I've seen the uh, ATM 650 paired up with a side address 450. I've used that combination before in my own personal studio, and I've also seen that in other studios like a out at you know Capitol Records and and Record Plant, uh, and and again you know microphones are the palette of, of the sound of the record of the producer and the artist. So as you know, there's many great microphone companies here. Audio Technica, of course, being the best. But uh, but yeah, those are the two I've I've used and I've seen used and and with great results. Thank you for that question. Good question. Thanks. Uh, we've got, well, a, a Twitter question just went by. They were, like, can talk about the difference in the experience of studio drumming versus live drumming. Well, studio versus live, of course, you know, live you get that one shot to get the song right. Count off the tune right uh, in the right tempo uh, in front of 10, 20,000 people. So that could be nerve wracking. Whereas the studio, there's the engineer and the players and no audience so that's easy um, a red light doesn't bother me that only bothers me when like you know I'm at home and my mortgage payments late and I see the phone ring and there's a red light that's that's a different kind of red light but <laughs> but in terms of studio and live you know it's just again playing in front of a lot of people that's that's nerve-wracking but then you know I've done it for so many years that I realized that oh wait they're not here to see me they're here to see Elton John or Sarah McLachlan or you know and then I then I get relaxed and realize oh okay I'm just the drummer I'm just one of the band members so that makes it easy when I think about it in those terms all right thanks a thank question? you ah uh, yes the hi Kurt <laughs> hello Jeff Fair first time I saw you was on Saturday Night Live and you were playing with Mick Jagger yes uh, blew me away Blew me away. In fact, sir. my wife and I both stopped, and our jaws just hit the floor. Can you tell us a little bit about that gig? Sure. Uh, Mick Jagger, you know, the, the greatest rock and roll singer, frontman on the face of this earth. He's, he's, you know, every moment spent with him was like a, a dreamland because this guy's, you know, the lead singer of the Stones. So how can you not go bonkers over that? Uh, playing with him, you know, it was it was uh, the way I got the gig. I, I think how that gig came about is I was recommended. Long story short, I show up for the uh, audition, and he said, uh, you know, they were they're jamming to like you know, paint it black and all the typical Stone songs, and uh, Mick turned around uh, in the front of the stage and asked me. He said, Kurt, what what song would you like to play? And in the back of my mind, knowing that he was a James Brown fan, I said, man, let's play um, uh, uh, Mother Popcorn. It was either Mother Popcorn or um, Give It Up or Turn It Loose or one of those tunes like that. So we started playing James Brown, and we started jamming for like 10, 15 minutes on James Brown. And he started doing the chicken dance with a big smile on his face. I was like, okay, either he loves this and he's going to send me home, or he loves it and he's going to hire me. So it was the latter. He hired me, and, um, you know, that, that year in 92 was uh, spent making the record with Rick Rubin producing, and then we did some spot dates in the East Coast and Midwest, and it was just a dream, dream come true. I'm sorry? Oh, on, on cloud nine. Yeah, a lot of sweat, a lot of, uh, a lot of sweat, but a lot of determination. Sweat from nervousness and determination because it's Mick Jagger. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Dan was on here just uh, on Twitter. Drum tuning, any tips? 
Yes, uh, I'll, I'll do the shorthand version of it. Uh, and I learned this from uh, you know, many great drum techs. My, my drum tech, Chris Hewer, uh, who's going to be touring with me on Sarah's tour starting next week, he uh, tunes my drums, specifically the toms, in fourths. So the bottom head will be tighter, top head looser. And when you, when you flick each side of the drum, it should be tuned in fourth, in fourths uh, with the uh, higher pitch on the bottom of the drum. And so that's usually the general rule of thumb for toms. Snare drums, that's just uh, preference and, and, and taste, as well as kick drum. But toms, th those are the, the real hard ones to get. But that's, that's definitely kind of the, the gist of drum tuning there. Cool. Uh, there we go. Question from the audience. Actually, I have two questions. I'll give it your choice. Okay. Quest, do you want question A or question B? Let's go with B. Okay, question B is when you're about to sit down, what goes through your mind as far as on a rhythmic basis? Like, like what gets you moving? Well, first of all, it has to be a good song. If it's not a good song, I have to find something to lock into musically that I'll find enjoyable to play to. Um, you know, it, it all it all really does boil down to the lyrics and melody for me. You know, be, being a drummer that plays behind many singers, it, that, that's always the thing that moves me first. That's most inspiring. And question a. yeah, what's question A? Question A is uh, okay. Buddy Rich or Neil Peart? Oh man, Buddy. Nice. Buddy, Buddy Rich. Buddy, Buddy. Uh, more questions from the house. What advice do you have for young musicians who um, coming up in the game and just trying to set themselves apart? Um, so, you know, <laughs> if you would if you would ask me this question in the '90s, I would have said get a nice drum set with some nice cymbals and good sticks. But now I'm saying get a computer, and get a good mic pre and Audio Technica microphones, so you can learn how to record yourself. Because the way the music industry is positions it itself. We're now in a place where you could record music anywhere at any time. So if a drummer wants to record drums and your guitar player friend needs drums on his song, you can record your own drums. So that's my Casey Porter. Yes. So right. that, that's the answer to my question there. All right. Get a computer. Pro Tools. Pro Tools. Okay. Logic. Oh, we have a question here. Oh, here we go. Just, be, uh, just because you mentioned James Brown, yes. I danced with him in the early 90s. You did? Yeah, I did. But I wanted to say, what was the uh, best you're... advice that your influence gave you, whether it was Morris Day or was it some another drummer that you said, I want to be like him? Uh, well, I, I mentioned Morris Day before right. as a drummer and, and musician. And, um, Another mentor of mine who actually brought me into this studio scene was Jeff Picaro. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jeff was uh, really instrumental in getting my start here in Los Angeles as a s session drummer. And he was really inspirational because I loved the way he played. He was so musical. You know, he played with one of my favorite bands, Toto. He played that funky yeah. groove on with Boss Gags. And he was just an awesome human being and, and, and funky. So I, I gravitated towards him. And uh, I'm dear friends with his parents. Uh, they live right around the corner from us, so we get to hang out all the time. And they tell me some great Jeff stories. And uh, he was a big influence, definitely, for sure, along with Morris. And all, there's, I mean, there's so many drummers out there that have influenced me. But those, those are the two guys that come to my mind, for sure. Was it a part of a rhythm thing they taught you? You know, like cause James Brown used to talk about the and beat and and one. Yeah, the one. It, the, the one. one. Yeah, yeah, the downbeat. The yeah. downbeat was imperative. And I, I get hired a lot because my I have a heavy foot. Not only you know do I play heavy, but it's also a wide foot. It's, I look like Barney Rubble with my shoes off. But uh, but um, you know I I, I I I gravitate towards groove. That's kind of my my forte. I can't um, I can't play a solo to save my life. I defer that to Vinny Caliuta. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks. Great question. Thank you. What else? More questions from the house? 
Huh? Question C. So, okay, every, I've spoken to a lot of drummers and they, they all have that one song that whenever they hear that snare on that song, they're like, God, I wish I had that snare. So, so what song is that for you? Oh, man. Whenever you hear it, you're just like, I fucking love that snare. There's a, um, there's a record that Steve Jordan played on called Talk is Cheap. Uh, with the expense of winos. And Steve Jordan and Charlie Drayton are two of my heroes. And whatever snare drum they used on that record, or snare drums, but there's one in particular. I, whenever I hear that record, I just like, ah, oh, I need that. And so I've been searching the world for that sound. So Steve or Charlie, if you're out there and you're watching this, just lay that snare drum on me. Just give it to me. I need it. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank <laughs> you. Question? Questions? Here we go. Uh, what is your biggest frustration that you have, I guess, in terms of either uh, technology or uh, just the way the audio industry is right now and that you would hope would improve uh, over time for upcoming artists? Is there anything? That That's an excellent question. I've had this conversation three times already today. and. Uh, my biggest frustration is when you're in the studio and you're recording and you want to listen to the playback and everyone goes inside and they're not listening. They're looking at the computer screen. And that drives me bonkers because it's like they're not listening. You're looking and they're going, oh, your snare drum's too loud there and your kick drum distorted there. And it's like, no, no, no. Let's get back to listening to music. So that's my biggest frustration with, as much as I love Pro Tools and I love digital audio and I'm a geek about it and I dig it and I use it myself, you know, I try to like, you know, I'll take my shirt off and throw it over the computer screen just so I could listen. And uh, I, I think maybe that's what we could all do as professionals is just start listening a little more rather than looking at waveforms. As much as I love doing that because I'm a geek like everyone else, but you know, listening is 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 imperative and you know being here with audio technica they have a plethora of mics here and they all sound different they all have a different characteristic and that's what it's about is listening and using what's best for the end result but that's that's definitely one of my biggest pet peeves if you will all right nice thanks thank you excellent question okay so i got a couple of i, I don't want to ignore the twitter people yep uh what's your favorite style of drumming to play I, I'm, I love playing funk and R&B and pop. Um, uh, you know, any, anything that has a good groove or a good feel. Um, I, I love playing odd meter when, when I get a chance to sit with it because uh, that's fun. You know, I, it gets to work my brain and my mechanics to, to do, um, you know, mathematical drumming, and, <laughs> if you will. And, uh, but... But it's all about the dance, you know. It's all about feeling good, and my job is to make people get up and and twerk. <laughs> oh, am I allowed to say twerk? <laughs> of course, <laughs> we've heard worse. No, I'm not going to twerk. <laughs> he makes people. <laughs> yeah. He's the twerky, not the twerker. I'm the twerky, not the twerker. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, okay, another Twitter question. How do you get gigs? Do you reach out to artists or do they come to you? You know, I've never... Um, I could count on maybe one hand soliciting getting a gig. It's all about word of mouth, you know, and when you get to play with the high level of players I get to play with, they will recommend you. Um, you know, I mentioned Jeff Picaro earlier when I was coming up. He started recommending me to a bunch of different producers, arrangers, composers, and uh, studio owners, and one of my first sessions uh, was with the great Bill Schnee, who had a studio down the street from where I lived in North Hollywood, and uh, that was one of my first sessions was at Bill Schnee studio with Bill through the recommendation of Jeff Picaro. So, yeah. word of mouth, definitely. Cool. All right. Question? Yes. Lucio. Hi. As a session mus a musician, have you ever, like, made a decision where like you didn't want to work in a project and then decided maybe I should have worked that like have you ever missed the shift and something and 
Many times. Many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it happens. You know, you think, oh, this isn't going to work out, and then it becomes a multi-million dollar seller, multi-platinum. Uh, but, you know, as, as the music business has changed, now, now you pretty much work on everything because it, it's, such a, it's a shrinking industry in, term, in terms of recording and, go, and, you know, because of the lack of record labels and, 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 and the lack of, uh, you know, everyone has a studio now at their house. And, yeah, and drum, drum machines and loops and all that stuff. So, yeah, there, there's been those moments, definitely. Another house question? Okay, Twitter. Someone wants to know, do you play any instruments other than drums? I play, <clears throat> um, in the privacy of my own home, bass, uh, guitar, keyboards, and I only sing in the shower. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty much it. But I, I, you know, I have my own uh, CD that I released uh, called CMB. Uh, that's out on, uh, you could get that on iTunes. And um, I just signed a publishing deal with uh, Stephen Bray, producer who produced Madonna, and he wrote the music for uh, The Color Purple. Uh, I just signed a deal with him where I'm writing music, all original compositions. Um, so that's been taken off really well. So, you know, I'm, I'm dabbling in everything now. It's, it, it's an industry now where you have to have a bunch of different hats, which I don't mind wearing. Yeah. Cool. Open it up to the house again. Come on. Yes. Uh, Kurt, did, you might have already talked about this, but you, you have a home studio where you do, you, you do drums. Yeah, 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 I could record so, drums at my house. Can you talk about, like, that setup and sort of how built out it is or, you know, how treated the room is or, you know, sort of how, how into it did you get? Um, I, I, I didn't get into any treatment of the room whatsoever. It's just my living room. Uh, I have vaulted ceilings, so that helps out a lot. Uh, a, a backstory to that is uh, the house was rented out by Jeff Picaro's sister, who then moved out of the house, and the house was sold to the great drummer Greg Bissonette. And then Greg Bissonette sold it to me. So if there's any drummers here that want to buy my house, <laughs> I'll sell it to you for... One million dollars, no, but I'll, I'll uh, yeah, <laughs> but I'll, but yeah, I mean it. It's it's just a living room. I set up my drums, and because of you know all the session work that I've done through the years, and asking the great Al Schmitz and Joe Ciccarellis and Dave Pensados how to mic a drum kit, I would I would show up early to the session, stay late after class, and ask them really stupid questions. Where does that mic cable go to, and what does it go into, and where do I put the microphone? How far away from the... You know, I'd ask these stupid questions, but what I thought were stupid questions then have paid off for me now because I know how to mic a drum kit. And so, you know, it, 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 if, you, if anyone ever gets an opportunity to show up early at a session, do it. And if you have any questions, you know, usually the, the engineer or the second engineer will always answer your, your stupid questions because they answered mine, so... Cool. Um, I don't know that this actually happened, but I'll ask the question anyway. Describe what it was like to play drums at Madison Square Garden with Elton John. Oh man, well that that was that was dreamlike. I'm, I'm getting chills just talking about it now again after many times. But you know, playing Madison Square Garden and it was a double drum thing because uh, the great Nigel Olson was playing drums as well. So we opened up the show with Funeral for a Friend. The place is sold out, 23,000 people, pack seat, pack house. And I'd look over, and there's Nigel Olsen smiling at me. And then I'd look down, and there's Elton on the piano smiling at me. And I'm going, wait a minute. I, I literally got my stick, and I kind of like jammed myself in the, in, the, in the leg just to remind myself that, wow, you're at Madison Square Garden with Elton. This is cool. And um, it, you know, t still to this day, it's definitely one of my greatest highlights of being a drummer and playing with such great talent such as Elton. Any questions from out there? I've got more Twitter if I... Yeah, Twitter's blowing up. Okay. Uh, in your opinion, what separates a good drummer from a great drummer? The drummer that plays less. If there's a drummer that plays less, he's going to get my attention. There's drummers that show up uh, whether it be live or, or studio, and they're just flailing chops everywhere. 
it's like, okay, you're awesome. You play 10 times faster than me and these seven other drummers. But again, like I mentioned earlier, it really is about playing for the song, for the music, for the lyrics, for the melody. Because that artist that you're playing behind, whether it's your band or you're a sideman hired to play, it's about conveying their message, their, their music to the audience. That audience paid a lot of money to come hear this song played, and they don't want to hear a drum solo. So that's my, my view on that. Cool. Thanks. There was a question. Chilitos. Hey, how are you? Good. Man. Um, what, I'm a drummer, too. So awesome. That's why, yeah. Yes. Um, do you, what is your technique in tuning your drums? Oh, uh, yeah, we covered this earlier, but I'll... Oh, I'm I'll, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. Well, I'll say it again. You know, I, I try to tune um, in fourths on my toms, okay. the bottom head being tighter. So I try to tune it to a fourth. So I got a little app on my iPhone, and I could play the fourth from whatever the note is to that drum. Okay. So I try to tune to the drum because not all drums are made equal. Right. You could get a Yamaha kit or a DW or Tama. They're all, a 10-inch Tom will sound different on each kit. So I try to tune to what that drum will sound like. And then, of course, with the kick, kick drum and the snare drum, that's all preference. Is that for live as well? For live as well, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great question. Thanks. Another question? Okay. Twitter universe. What are yeah, they saying out in the world of Twitter? Okay, besides the upcoming tour and your CD, what other projects are you working on? Um, I'm involved with... Uh, um, another project uh, with my dear friend Alex Alessandroni and um, and uh, his father is he was the whistler on all those spaghetti westerns uh, Good, Bad and the Ugly and all, all those Ennio Morricone um, scored movies and uh, so he's putting together uh, some tunes along with uh, Giuseppe Patene uh, a bass player, dear friend of mine, wonderful musician and producer. Um, they're putting together music of music that was recorded in the late 60s, early 70s of this Italian pop music. And they're going to try to uh, get it to play in universities and film festivals. And uh, so I've been part of the recording process of that and playing drums on it as well. So I'm really excited about that. That's kind of been a fun project to do. Plus, you know, hanging around with all those Italians, I get to eat good food. <laughs> uh, how about a most memorable concert experience? Uh, I'll definitely refer back to Madison Square Garden with Elton, okay. for sure. Okay, okay here, Nicole, hey, is, Nicole. A huge, is a huge Billy Joel fan. Any cool oh, right stories from working with him? You know, nothing cool, just other than the fact that I was there playing drums behind him when... Um, you know, we did two nights at Madison Square Garden again with Elton John, and he had a bunch of guest artists. <laughs> yeah, Mr. G. Um, he had a bunch of uh, guest artists come in and play with Elton, and one of those guest artists happened to be Billy Joel, and he came in and they put up two pianos butted up against each other, and that was just a dream come true, seeing you know, two of the most amazing you know, contemporary artists playing piano, singing together, and I got to play drums. How awesome is that? Pretty freaking awesome. Okay, come on. House questions. We got to have a house question. I love your questions, bro. Thank Keep you, it coming. Um, when I was younger, I begged my mom to buy me a drum set. She didn't do it because she told me she had six kids. So instead, I bought turntables. You know, I've owned them for 20 years, uh, I've been DJing for 15 years. Have you ever DJed before? No, but I'd love to because yeah. there's there's something I relate to that. It's uh, all patterns. So yeah, it's all patterns, and, it and I I was at a party in New York a few years ago, and Questlove was DJing, and I just thought, okay, that's cool, drummer, DJ. So it got the wheels spinning in my head, and but then I realized I don't have enough time to to learn that aspect. But I have such respect for 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 DJing, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay, and I, I got one here that um, from Twitter again. Like, just talk a little bit about the experience of of uh, 
drumming for a, on a soundtrack for a movie? Well, uh, <clears throat> see, the latest one I did was uh, with uh, the great Hans Zimmer. He uh, wrote and scored uh, the movie Man of Steel. And Man of Steel uh, was done with 12 drummers. So a lot of what you see on that Man of Steel movie soundtrack, which came out two years ago, uh, it's all live drums. Uh, and so the drummers that were involved with that uh, was my dear friend Satnam Mangotra. He was the one that put us all together. He was the main drummer who, who uh, came up with some cool parts for us to play. It was myself, John Robinson, JR, uh, Matt Chamberlain, the great Jim Keltner, uh, another dear friend of mine, Anastasios Panos. Tas Panos was playing, uh, Bernie Dressel, Trevor Lawrence Jr., uh, Sheila E., Vinnie Caliuda. Um, and then the second round, Pharrell came in and played drums. And then uh, along with Pharrell was Jason Bonham, John Bonham's son. So that right there was another dream moment where I got to hang with all my drum heroes and play on a Superman movie. So that was pretty, that was pretty cool. Okay, I can take one more question because we're, we're out of time. Oh, already? Yeah, 30 minutes. All right, well, let's uh, thanks, say thanks to Thank Kurt. you, Jeff. Thank you, Audio Technica. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Enjoy the show. Salute.